और just start this uh, colloquium of the department. It is a great pleasure to have today a speaker of the colloquium, Renato Renner from ETH in Zurich, a leading expert in quantum physics. Renner obtained his PhD from the ETH, then was a research fellow in Cambridge, and later on he became professor at the ETH, where he is now the head of the research group for quantum information theory. His research interests are in the area of quantum information, quantum thermodynamics, and quantum cryptography. And among uh, his several awards, let me just mention the TCC Test of Time Award of the International Association for Cryptologic Research. Furthermore, and this is more interesting for us today, Renner is a leading figure in the foundation of quantum physics. Well, his research had a great impact even in the philosophers' community. I, you can really check that many uh, papers in philosophy concern his research. So the title of this colloquium is a thought experiment to test the consistency of quantum theory and concern precisely some controversial but fundamental aspect of quantum reality. Since the beginning of a quantum theory, starting from the celebrated EPR paradox and the strange simultaneously dead and alive Schrodinger cat, it became clear that two astonishing properties of quantum systems, superposition and entanglement, produce effects that question our conception itself of physical reality. With an iconic sentence of Bohr, Everything we call real is made of things that cannot be regarded as real. After Bell and the experimental verification of the violation of its inequality, proving that entangled quantum subsystems cannot have an independent reality, and after Koch and Specker proving that in general, the value of physical quantities cannot have a reality independent of the measurement of other quantities, the work of Renner, deepening the intuition of Wigner, put another piece in the puzzle concerning the role of the observers in quantum systems. So let's seem to introduce us to these amazing and controversial aspects of quantum reality. Please. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for the invitation to this colloquium. It's a real pleasure to have, again, a real audience. This is actually, I think, the first real colloquium I give after the pandemic. So um, it's very nice to see actual faces in real and not only the screen. And I hope according that there will also be many questions after the talk and maybe even some interesting discussions afterwards. So as Pier Alberto mentioned, this is a controversial topic and you will see some part of this controversy during my talk. And usually it's also an emotional topic for some people because Many have strong feelings about how quantum theory should be understood. And that's why I'm particularly looking forward to the question session. Okay, so let's start with a kind of basic question that um, let's say any quantum physicist certainly somehow cares about. And this is the question about what's the range of validity of quantum theories. You see here on the left, I mean, this is a line going from very small size objects to very large objects, objects of astronomical size. And if you ask yourself, what is quantum theory supposed to be and where has it actually been experimentally tested? Then you see that if you start with the first question, what is it supposed to be? Quantum theory is supposed to describe the elementary building blocks of our universe, if you like. It describes to a very good accuracy and we do the best accuracy we ever had in the history of physics, single particles, atoms, and also molecules. Now, because quantum theory describes these building blocks and because larger objects, like objects of daily size, and the cat stands here just for an object of a usual size that we, we see in, in our daily life, but even astronomical objects, maybe not yet black holes. I will, um, um, here I put the black hole at the center of our galaxy as an astronomical object. This involves also gravity, which 
at the moment we cannot describe with quantum theory, but basically all the building blocks, all the molecules the cat consists of are described by quantum theory. So it's reasonable to assume that quantum theory is in a sense a universal theory that describes everything, that it wouldn't stop here. And we don't, we wouldn't draw a line and say, everything on the left is correctly described, but as soon as we put things together, it's no longer correctly described. That would also, from a conceptual viewpoint, be a bit strange, one would say. Nonetheless, if you go to the experimental side, then we have direct tests, and as I already pointed out, very accurate tests of quantum theory for, for very small objects. And there, the predictions of quantum theory are actually um, reproduced by experiments to an amazing precision. If you go to slightly larger objects, then you can still reproduce the very special features of quantum theory. For example, there are double slit experiments with quite big molecules that you can carry out and you still see the interference pattern. So we could say maybe not if a high accuracy, quantitatively, but at least qualitatively, we can reproduce quantum theory also for larger and larger objects, but they're still from our perspective as humans, pretty small objects. And the question I would like to address here is really whether we, what we expect here to be the case where we don't have any experimental tests. And you notice that the title of my talk is Sort Experiments. So while we cannot move into this area currently, I mean, people are working hard to push the limits here and all this development of quantum technology will ultimately push this boundary and maybe in 10 years, the green area will go up to here and maybe the orange one will move up to objects we can actually see with our naked eyes. But I'm a theorist and as a theorist, I, I, I'm not restricted by technology. So I can think of experiments here. There are thought experiments. And of course, thought experiments I cannot really carry out. Nonetheless, as we will see, and this will be a main message of this talk, we can learn something from thought experiments. And of course, that's not the first time this happens. I mean, there were many, even very famous thought experiments in the past that brought insights, but that's basically the tool of a theorist to make thought experiments. So here, I mean, it's of course not a coincidence that I put the cat here. I even have a real image of this particular cat. It looks like this. This is um, actually very close to where I live in Zurich. Um, it's the house where Erwin Schrödinger lived and they have a little metal cat outside, out of, in the garden next to the house. And the, you can take pictures of it. And the claim is that depending on the light condition, it looks dead or alive. I only saw it alive, but maybe if you go there by night, maybe next time you're in Zurich, try it out and see whether it's still alive. So this is the address, by the way. Okay, so let me briefly start with this Schrödinger cat experiment, just to make sure, I mean, I, it's kind of a, a very famous experiment, but uh, let me nonetheless start with that to make sure everything is on the same boat, so to speak. And by the way, this is an animal-friendly version of Schrödinger's cat experiment. So what is Schrodinger's cat experiment? We put a cat in a, into a perfectly isolated box. But let's suppose, and this was maybe not the initial setup by Schrodinger, but let's suppose for, for later for this talk that we can once open the box and let one, let's say, spin particle enter the box, but otherwise it's perfectly isolated. So perfectly isolated really means that no, physical influence can go from inside to the outside. There's no radiation, nothing. So this will be very hard to achieve. And um, I will come back to this, let's say, technological aspects at the very end of the talk as an outlook. But for the moment, here again, I'm a theorist, so I can just think of realizing this and then it's done. So let's now um, Suppose that we set up the experiment in such a way that there is a little feeding machine inside of the box. And whenever, when this machine first measures the spin of this particle, and if it spin up, it would drop some food. So this is now the case, and the cat is happy now, as you can see. Conversely, if the spin is down, the machine um, closes 
the exit here of the food and the cat is remains hungry as before. Now, the interesting question is, as you know, I mean, I, I chose here a spin, not something else. And as you know, from quantum mechanics, the spin can also be put into a superposition of up and down. And the question is now, what happens now? Will the cat end up being happy or does it remain hungry? Now, what we can do is we can, I mean, this box is isolated, so we cannot look. We don't see anything, just see gray. So what happens if you do it? What we can do is we can just use the formalism of quantum mechanics. And the formalism of quantum mechanics contains one important ingredient, and that's the linearity of quantum mechanics. So what does linearity mean? So maybe I'll briefly go back. Remember that I told you what happens when it's up. When it's up, the cat will end up being happy. And when it's down, it ends up being hungry. And if it's a superposition by linearity, this quantum state we would assign to the cat has to be the sum of the two. That's just the quantum mechanical rule. It's not yet said what that means. That's just when we blindly, so to speak, um, apply the formalism of quantum theory, it tells us that the state of whatever is in this box is now this so-called superposition of a cat that is happy and a cat that is hungry. This is only the linearity of quantum theory that is used here. And that's what Schrödinger already noticed very early in the development of quantum theory. And he was, of course, a bit worried about this because it's not obvious what the physical meaning of such a state is. So um, that's what he wrote about this. That's in German, but um, he wrote in German, but what it says is that um, it, the wave function, so psi is the wave function, that's the thing that has these two cats, is now an instrument for the prediction of probabilities of, yeah, this is a strange word, but of things you can measure is probably what he meant. So, what he would say is that maybe we don't need to take this too serious. This looks like a strange thing, a cat that has, is, is both at the same time hungry and happy. But if you just see it as a mathematical tool to predict things that we would see, then it's okay, because then it's just an expression like a probability. So it would then have the same role as if I take a coin. I don't have a coin. Maybe I should if you take a coin because I will need it later anyway. So I'll, I flip a coin here. It has, has heads or tails, and I cover it. And now I would ask you, is it tails or heads? Now you would probably say it's tails with 50% probability and heads with 50% probability. But obviously, it's either tails or heads. I can see what it is. It's heads. So when you say it's 50%, this is just a statement about the prediction you can make. So it's not really a statement about this coin, it's partially a statement about how much you know about the coin. And that's one possible way to interpret that thing, which is less drastic than saying the cat is really in a superposition between being hungry and not hungry, or in the original experiment between being dead or alive. But there are other, others who would say, no, this is actually a physical state. And there has been a lot of debate about what that now means. And I think um, this debate is still going on and I will come back to it, what it means. But let me for the moment um, um, come to a, diff a kind of different question. So if, we, if, if I said the same thing about molecules, like I would say, um, I just have a molecule which with amplitude one half is in one state and with amplitude one half in the other state, then we know this is actually something which is physically relevant and we can, for example, it, it gives rise to interference patterns and things like that. So in that case, we wouldn't be too worried. So why shouldn't this also be the case for cats? Sometimes, somehow it's re reasonable to assume, I mean, there's a kind of difference. You would assume you could be the cat. And clearly if you are inside this box and you are this cat, then you know that you have eat, that you have food or not. You can just look at it and it looks like a measurement. I mean, this is quantum mechanically a measurement. You look at it and you either eat or not. So it's, 
you will never be in, in a state which somehow consists of two things. But nonetheless, the description before would be correct if we just in, assume that quant the same formalism that describes these objects correctly describes these objects correctly. So there's now basically two possibilities. One possibility is that quantum theory breaks down here and this description I just gave, the superposition state is not the correct description. But then there must be somehow a difference between cats and, and molecules, something that tells physics to behave differently. Or the alternative would be that indeed the cat is correctly described by this state, and then we just have to have the correct interpretation of what that means, and maybe that's also fine. Now one could therefore ask the question, what makes the cat really different from that? What could it be that makes the physics behave differently for a cat than this thing? And, okay, people thought about this, and one idea is that maybe it's gravity. And you see, that's why I put the black hole here. Gravity is extremely relevant. Well, maybe already for a cat, gravity is somehow relevant because whether the cat is now lying here or, or moving a bit in the box, that will create a gravitational field. And gravity is not described yet, according to our current um, understanding. We cannot describe it quantum mechanically. So there's the possibility that gravity is fundamentally a classical theory that doesn't fit into quantum mechanics and that whenever the objects are so large that gravity plays a role, then things will become classical and this superposition will no longer exist. So that's, for example, an idea that um, Roger Penrose proposed very famously. And there, I think a pretty, I mean, not so many, but a considerable fraction of physicists who think in that direction, that as soon as the object is large, then because of gravity, this, um, these, um, quantum mechanics is no longer applicable here. Here I want to, in this talk about going to a different direction. So I don't want to um, take gravity as a help. And this is just because we don't know enough about gravity yet. I mean, this is very speculative to say that gravity breaks quantum theory. And it's even based on the assumption that gravity is not itself describable by quantum theory. I want to do something which doesn't require any reference to gravity. And for that, we first make a step and replace the cat by a physicist. Now you may say, okay, that, that is just a, a joke. Why should there be a difference whether it's a cat or a physicist? There will be a difference, as you will see later, but this was not an idea that is new. This is something that already Eugene Wigner proposed. He wrote a paper, and you can say this paper is maybe the analog of Schrödinger's cat. Um, proposal. He just proposed to do a similar thing with a human, with a physicist. Um, so his idea was again to describe, to put this friend of his, so this is why it's called the Wigner's friend experiment, what he proposed to the friend into a perfectly isolated box, and then describe this friend using quantum theory. And then one would again end up with a superposition state. So let's see what that means. Or, or maybe before I say what it means, I, I say something about what is a bit different about this. So to compare to the cat. So from a modern perspective, I'm a quantum information theorist, and from a modern perspective, you could say there's now an important aspect which wouldn't be there if this person was just a molecule or so. Namely, the aspect is that this person who is in the box can herself think about other quantum systems. So this person is a physicist who can herself apply quantum theory and make predictions. You will see why this is relevant later. So in this setup, we have a more interesting situation. So this is this W stands for Wigner. So it's now an experiment where th before this was the cat and this was Schrödinger. Now this is Wigner's friend and this is Wigner. And the situation is now that Wigner can think about his friend um, as a quantum system, but at the same time, the friend himself self can think about the smaller quantum system, which is also in the box. So in effect, Wigner thinks about how the friend thinks about the quantum system. So it's kind of an iterated um, process of, of 
thinking about what is the quantum system and what is the subject that reasons about the quantum system. I will come back to that as well. That will be an important aspect of what I'm going to do. So that's maybe one of the basic ideas of this thought experiment, namely that we use quantum theory to describe systems. And the system is, for example, this box that includes itself of users of quantum theory. So this guy uses quantum theory to describe another user of quantum theory. That's an important theme that will now come up. So now we have a, another distinction. I said before, it's very difficult to draw a line between what could be different here from here. How could it be that here quantum mechanics potentially could break down and not here? So as I said, gravity is an option. That's only relevant here and not for single atoms probably. But another thing is, this fact that whether a system can itself be a user of quantum theory. So if a single atom cannot apply quantum theory, it simply not, doesn't have the intellectual capacity to do it, nor a molecule, but a, a human can. So maybe, and that's the question we can ask, maybe quantum theory breaks down as soon as we ask it to describe objects which can be so complex that, that, that they can themselves use quantum theory. So that's... Um, Kind of as a preparation for them now going to do it. So let me briefly come back to this Wigner's friend experiment and describe it a bit more closely. So this is just what Vig Eugene Wigner proposed again, and this is very similar to Schrödinger's cat. So he set up the following um, scheme. So this is again Wigner. This is his friend. Let's call her Alice. Alice gets an instruction from Wigner. Namely, Wigner tells her, please take, I mean, there's also a spin in this lab. Maybe Wigner could send in that spin as before. And Wigner instructs Alice, as soon as you receive this spin here, this spin particle, please measure it in the up-down basis and just look at the result. You don't need to do anything else, just observe the result. So now it's clear what, and what's going on. And Wigner could describe what's happening in this box in terms of the language of quantum theory. And in terms of the language of quantum theory, he would say there is this spin particle, which here is called R. And Wigner also describes, I mean, he describes everything in the box as a quantum system. So he describes the state of Alice as a quantum state. And I just call this the state ready. That's the state when Alice is ready to start measuring. He says at the beginning, that's the state. And then he knows because he instructed Alice in that way to measure. So he knows as time evolves later, if the if the spin was up, it will of course remain up if Alice looks at it. And Alice would say, I observed that it was up. And conversely, if the spin was down, then after this measurement by Alice, the spin is down. And now it's the same thing as for Schrödinger's cat. We now ask what happens if the spin is neither up or down, but in a superposition state of up and down. And I will for the future always call this superposition state spin right, because as you probably know, spin right is actually a superposition of up and down. And what is left or right is of course a, a matter of convention and design is also a matter of convention and I will use this convention here. So let's ask what happens if he gives this now to Alice. So what happens, and now it's not surprising after what I told you, I, I told you quantum mechanics is linear, and you knew that, of course, already. By linearity, what comes out is now, I mean, you just superpose these two options that were on this slide. Just notice there's a plus on the left, and now there's also by linearity of this time evolution a plus on the right. So we get this result. So in other words, what Wigner concludes is that in this box is now an Alice who is in a superposition between having seen up and indeed the particle is up and having seen down and the particle is down. What does this now mean? Now, as I said before, already for Schrödinger's experiment, physicists don't agree on what this means, not at all. And this has led to so-called interpretations of quantum theory. And there are still today all these interpretations. So this shows the fact that there are all these different interpretations shows that people don't agree. Usually everyone thinks his interpretation is the only truth. And they would say, you know, what, how quantum mechanics work and then they fight. But at the end, they just follow different interpretations. So 
let's let's let me give you just a quick overview on them. This is not supposed to be um, a, an exhaustive list, and I will also not go into details. Just to give you an idea of of this claim that I make that physicists don't agree. I mean, in this experiment, you can now make two claims. Alice will make a claim. She's in the box, and she will clearly say either I observed up or I observed down. I mean, if you were yourself in the box and would listen, then Alice would say each of either of these two things. So that's what you would expect. But as I just said, if you apply quantum mechanics from Wigner's viewpoint, from the outside viewpoint, one would say Alice is now in a superposition between having observed up and down. And now you could ask which of these claims are considered as true claims by the different physicists who follow the different interpretations. And maybe the most famous interpretation is this Copenhagen interpretation, which says that basically um, you always have to separate the world into microscopic parts and macroscopic parts. And you are only supposed to apply quantum theory to the microscopic parts. And clearly Alice is not microscopic. Therefore, and um, oh, here, this is a mistake. This should say Wigner, by the way. So replace this by Wigner. <laughs> And so Wigner should say, um, you know, in cryptography, we always have Alice and Bob, so I probably got used to that. So this is Wigner. Wigner would say that, but Copenhagen would say, no, Wigner is wrong. He cannot say that because Alice is just not a, macro, is not a microscopic object. So it doesn't make sense to say it's in a superposition. The same is true for so-called collapse interpretation. So what I said before about Penrose's view that gravity is classical and therefore if a system is large enough and has a gravitational field that is noticeable different depending on its state, then things become classical. That's, an, that's one example of a collapse theory. And in this collapse theory, they would also say it's not true. It's just Alice is too large. Gravity has an effect. and This will collapse the wave function. So Penrose, for example, would also say and Wigner is not right. Here. But then there are other interpretations, for example, quantum Bayesianism or cubism, as it's called. And they would say, no, everything is just a, a matter of perspective. Both Alice and Wigner are right. They're for themselves. It's a bit like in relativity theory that there are different reference frames. And for example, you don't move with respect to me. But if I was standing on the sun, for example, and would look, the, look at the whole Earth, I would say clearly you are moving together with the Earth. And both views are correct for themselves. And so cubism is an interpretation that says, that's fine. We should just take the observers as different reference frames, so to speak, in, I mean, in this analogy. And then there's no reason why one of them is wrong. They, they make different claims. They're obviously different in a certain sense, but they're both right from their perspective. The same is true for what is called relational quantum mechanics. This is um, something that is proposed by Carlo Rovelli who is um, also thinking recently or very deeply about these questions. And this is in a sense on that level on which I'm explaining similar to cubism, although there are actually differences and um, that's why they're on different lines, but I'm not going into that. There's also something called Bohmian mechanics. And here it's both are true for a different reason. They would say everything, every object, like even a macroscopic object like Alice has a quantum state. So it's correct to say the quantum state of Alice is that, but at the same time are additional variables which tell us what she actually really does or, or in which state she really is in a certain sense. So Bohmian mechanics has both a wave function that says this and additional variables, position variables, which tell you whether, for example, she observed up or down. So in that sense, also two statements are true, but they're just referring to different objects mathematical objects in that theory. And many words is interesting because they would say that's clearly the correct statement, but Alice is not right because Alice is actually in reality in two worlds. And she's, um, if she thinks she sees up, she's actually wrong because there's another parallel world in which she sees down. So that statement is, is not true, or let's say the claim would be true if I would put an and here. She knows she sees up and she also knows she sees down. And there are also famous um, people in the foundations community today, um, like um, David Deutsch and um, Lev Weitman and, and many others, 
who um, believe that's the right view. But you see, there are very diverging views. And um, however, we, we cannot really test them against each other, except for a little bit. And this was actually a proposal by David Deutsch, whom I just mentioned. He said, if there's really such a collapse by gravity, then in principle, we should be able to detect that. And the detection is very easy. We just measure the whole lab in which Alice is in a basis with respect to the state that was proposed. So remember the state that Alice is in is that she it is the superposition between having observed up and down. So if you now carry out the measurement with respect to a measurement basis in which this is just one measurement basis state, then we should always, if this is true that she's in that state, get the outcome that this was the correct description. Of course, in reality, we cannot do this measurement because that's an extremely complicated measurement on a quantum system, on a system that includes humans and and we cannot do quantum operations so precisely on them to realize this. But in principle, he said, we could distinguish um, this. And then, therefore, at least the second line could be excluded because according to the collapse theory, such a measurement wouldn't give that result because the state would have collapsed. And probably also it would also probably exclude Copenhagen in, in the way I described. Okay, so but let me now... Um, do something different. So this would be a real experiment, which we cannot do, unfortunately. So as I said at the beginning of the talk, we, we may want to still know what's happening here with so and, and try to explore that with sort experiments. And that's what I now want to propose in the remainder of the talk. I want to describe to you a sort experiment that makes a claim about this red area here. And the claim is the following. The claim is that quantum theory cannot consistently describe users of quantum C. So now from given all the introduction I gave, I hope this claim is more or less clear, but I will of course now tell you in more detail what it means. But let me first tell you what happens when this claim came out, because that's quite from a sociological viewpoint, maybe interesting. So when we published this paper or put it on ePrint archive, I got thousands of emails, but I even got real letters like postal, conventional postal letters. So I got a whole highlight. I took here the picture. I never saw that before. So this is why I told you before, it's a very emotional topic. If someone makes a claim there and, and people don't agree, they start to write very long letters. Usually they, they just come up with, or they describe their own theories, which they developed since a long time and say why this theory is now finally confirmed by this and so on. So many people saw it very positively and so this sort experiment confirms what they always saw to be true. Anyway, there was also an interesting blog um, by Scott Aronson, which posed a long discussion. And I just say, say that because there was one particular comment by a physicist, which I really liked. So remember the, the claim here is that quantum theory cannot consistently describe users of quantum theory. And then there was a long debate about it. And at the end of the debate, he said this, uh, users of quantum theory cannot consistently decide what quantum theory is. So <laughs> that was really showing, again, physicists don't agree what it should be. And, and this has to do with this slide I showed before with the interpretations. Of course, when you want to ask such a question, you have to really know which of the claims are correct and which not. And I think this is a, a real problem that we don't really agree what quantum theory is. But in order, therefore, to make my claim more well defined, I need to, to specify what is meant. And of course, the claim is only convincing if it uses parts of quantum theory to which everyone agrees, so to speak. And or at least where one can clearly see if someone doesn't agree and where it is. So that's what I want to do next. But but in order to do that, so I, I moved, I, I first transitioned from the cat to a human, and then now I will replace the humans by a computer because, because a computer is much more reliable in the sense that once I program the computer with the rules of quantum theory, then it's well defined what quantum theory is. It's just defined by these rules. Whereas the human would always again get confused and say, ah, oh, but in this case it doesn't apply. And in that case, you also have to consider this and that. So in order to make it a well-defined statement, one should it's I mean, this will not really be um, very important now, but it's kind of useful to think of the agents from now on, Alice and Wigner and so on, as computers. 
that are programmed with the rules of quantum theory. This just makes it much more down to earth in a certain sense. So we have now this thing. So the, the human is now replaced by a computer. And the question is, can quantum theory consistently describe a computer that is programmed with the rules of quantum theory? So now you see it's, it's no longer, so this, this entire, because many of these letters I got were talking about consciousness and religion and so on. So this hopefully um, separates this completely. This is a, a very well-defined scientific question. I can program a computer and I can ask, does quantum theory correctly describe that computer that is programmed with the very rules of the theory that I use to describe the computer? And of course, if, the theory, if quantum theory is universally valid, this should be the case because computers are part of our universe. And so if quantum theory applies to everything in the universe, then it also applies to computers. So you should think of it now more precisely in the following way. So think of the computers are programmed with the formalism of quantum theory. And I will tell you, not in detail, but roughly what, what I mean by that. And then, of course, the computer needs to know what is the experiment it should make a prediction about. And then maybe you also feed into the computer some observations that are made in, in, when you carry out an experiment. And then the computer should be able to make further predictions. I've programmed the computer, it should be able to say, uh, if you're now going to do this spin measurement, then the outcome will be that particular value. I mean, that's the purpose of programming the computer, that it can make predictions. Now, why? Do I talk about computers here again? So notice that a computer will in the following have two roles. Um, and one role is it's a subject which uses quantum theory. So this is indicated by this. The computer is programmed with Schrodinger's equation and can make prediction about the quantum system. That's what you do when you do computational physics. That's precisely what you do. You program a computer with quantum physics and it makes predictions. But it has also now, in, for the purpose of this talk, at the same time a role as an object, which is the computer is itself a quantum system, of course. It's a system consisting of, of objects that are described by quantum theory. So here the Schrodinger equation is outside. It describes the computer and maybe stuff that is next to the computer. If you put everything into a box, you can say this is a big quantum system. And now the whole experiment is also suddenly much more realistic because we, you can now, I said before, it's very difficult to have a perfectly isolated box. But actually, I would claim in the next 10 years, we will have that at least large enough to put the computer inside it. Namely, when you build a quantum computer, then what you have to do is you have to perfectly isolate the relevant qubits from the environment. So now instead of using these qubits that you now that are perfectly isolated, to run a quantum algorithm, you can, can also run it, just the classical algorithm on it. For example, the algorithm that tells you how to apply quantum theory. But the qubits are perfectly isolated. So the claim is once we have quantum computers, we actually have such a perfect box. So in that sense, what I'm now, this thought experiment is not even an unrealistic thought experiment, maybe in 10 or 20 years. Okay. So the I stressed at the beginning that there will be a kind of nested use. So what will be important in the, in the sort experiment is that we will feed the computer with a, quant, a description of a quantum system, and then it can make statements about the quantum system. But we can also feed the we can also feed this green computer with a description of the experiment which contains another computer. So here the green computer is supposed to make a statement about how the blue computer makes a prediction about the spin. So this is this nested thing, but I hope I convinced you by now that this should in principle work. If quantum theory is a consistent theory, then this should be possible that um, the green computer reasons about how the blue computer reasons about that. And the blue computer has now these two roles that I mentioned before. It's the subject reasoning about the spin, but it's the object about which the green computer reasons. So the sort experiment we proposed actually is a bit complicated in the sense that it has four agents, if you like. Here they are again drawn as humans, but these will be computers again on the next slide. So basically, you should think of the experiment as like two Wigner's friend experiments. So we have one friend of Wigner, and this is, let's say, Wigner. 
one of the beginners. Okay, it's of course here some gender equality as you can see. And then there is an, another friend and the, here another Wigner. So this Wigner belongs to this friend and this Wigner to that friend, so to speak. And so this means this Wigner here, or this we call her Ursula, reasons about Alice, whereas Wigner here reasons about, um, actually, in the, it will be complicated. She will reason about that. And it will be four things. So as I will just explain in the next slide, this one will reason about that, that one about this, this one about that, and this one again about this. So you see, it's actually a circle at the end. But in terms of measurements, so this one will apply what I called before a Deutsch measurement, and this one will apply a Deutsch measurement from this line. Okay, so that's a complicated thing. So, so the remainder of the talk, I will only explain that in detail, and then we are done. So let me start with that. So again, the agents are now replaced by computers. There are four computers, and I made four colors. And each, and there is now an experiment which is very explicit. We tell these computers what to do. So each computer gets a set of instructions what it should do. And of course, you, I mean, this is quite an involved experiment. The idea is not that you now remember all these instructions, it's more that you see the flavor of it. What type of instructions do they get? So don't be worried if, if this. So for example, the blue computer is supposed to generate a random bit. And for that, you should use quantum randomness. So it just basically flips a quantum coin, if you like. And, or you can say you take a spin, which is in a superposition between up and down, and you measure in the up-down basis. So that's what you should do. And then as a next step, he should prepare a spin particle. So if I was this blue computer, I would first need to flip the coin. And then if the coin is for example, um, heads, then I'm supposed to prepare a spin which points downwards. If the coin was tails, then I would need to prepare the spin to the right. And remember, to the right means superposition of up and down. And then I send this spin away to the green computer. So that's what, what the blue computer has to do. And then he should make a prediction. That's the important thing. The blue computer is also supposed to make a prediction what the red computer will measure. Of course, I will tell you what, what type of measurement the red computer will apply, but the blue computer knows the whole setup and he's supposed to predict what the blue computer, uh, what the red computer will measure. Okay, so what does the green need to do? The green receives this spin that I sent him, measures it in the up-down basis, and then, when he measures it in the up-down basis, he will, the green computer will be able to infer what this randomness was of the blue one. I will show you that on, on the next slide. At least sometimes he will be able to say, to know what is R. And then the blue computer, once the, the green computer knows what R is, he can also make the same predictions as the blue computer. So he's in, he, he should infer the computer the predictions that the blue computer did. So you see that the green computer has to reason about what the blue computer does. This is now exactly what happens. And then it continues. I mean, this is always similar. Like this one is supposed to measure this whole lab, so to speak, in this so-called Deutsch basis. So that's a measurement that he has to carry out. And then from the outcome of the measurement, he can infer something about the green computer, as we will see, and then he makes he infers what prediction the green computer made, and he tells this prediction to the red computer. And now notice this prediction is what the red will measure. So the yellow computer will tell the red computer what it will measure at the end. The red computer just reads this message and says, oh, I will measure this particular thing. He measures and checks whether the prediction was correct. Okay, so that's a very involved experiment, but let's now, um, briefly um, go into what the comp I said several times, the computers have to make a prediction. So what do they actually do? As I said, the computers are programmed with the rules of quantum theory. So very concretely, they're only programmed basically with one rule of quantum theory. They're programmed with the rule that when, when you have a state, a description of, of a quantum state of a system which doesn't include the computer itself. So if I'm a user of quantum theory, I cannot really and talk about my own quantum state, even if I was 
if I even if I believe that I'm myself a quantum system, that would I mean that would be very delicate. I, I wouldn't know how to do. It. But if the quantum state is a, a quantum state of another system of this little thing, then if I'm good enough in quantum physics, I should be able to figure out um, how to now make predictions. And so let's suppose psi is a quantum state of some system and pi set is a measurement projector corresponding to an outcome set of some measurement. Now we know from quantum theory, that's the so-called Born rule, that whenever the overlap between the projection and the quantum state is maximal, is, is one, then with certainty that outcome will occur. That's a rule of quantum theory. And that's what I need from quantum theory, precisely that rule. So whenever this happens, the computer will output this statement. Now I'm certain that the measurement has outcome set. So the computer just looks at the quantum state and knows what the measurement projector is um, of the measurement device and checks this for all possible measurement projectors. And whenever it's one, it issues this statement. But the computers also reason about other computers. And this is a second rule. So the computers apply this first rule that I call the rule Q, that's quantum mechanics. But they also apply a consistency rule. What is this consistency rule? The consistency rule is the following. Suppose that Pierre Alberto, he's a great physicist, um, probably much more reliable than I am. If I know that he did a calculation and he arrived at the, calc at the result that a particular measurement outcome is set. So suppose he's the, he's the blue person, I'm the green one and know that he arrived at this result. Then if I know that he uses the same quantum mechanical rules as I do, I should just take this result as valid and say, okay, now I can also um, issue that result because I just figured out that he came to that conclusion and he used exactly the same theory that I'm using. So that's basically consistency. If this wasn't true, it wouldn't even make sense that we talk among each other because somehow if someone says something, first of all, I just know he said that, but then I also want at some point to take this as a knowledge and I can only do that if I trust the person. But this is not about trust in this experiment because in this experiment, we just programmed all computers with the same rules of quantum theory. So by default, they are kind of trustworthy in that sense. Then the last rule is kind of an obvious rule that if, if at the end, if I reason in my um, in using such rules and I come to the conclusion, to two contradicting conclusions, I come to the conclusion that if I now measure this spin here and it's up, but I also, with another line of argument come to the conclusion, no, certainly it will be down. Then I would kind of ring an alarm bell and say something was wrong with my rules. They led to two contradictory, um, contradictory conclusions. So this shouldn't happen. That's the rule S basically you should read it as whenever this happens, the computer rings a bell and says, I was programmed with very bad rules. This wasn't good, it led to a contradiction. Okay, now let's see what happens if these computers apply these rules. And I will not go through the whole experiment. I will just show you in the first step what happens so that you can see how the, the kind of argument. So let's suppose the, the blue computer, as I told you before, it, it first generates a coin toss. And if the, the coin is heads, then it, it chooses the spin to be down and it sends that spin to the other computer. And, and by the way, if it was tails, it will be the spin right. Now, if, let's suppose, um, actually, the, and this um, computer here arrives at the conclusion that, oh, no, let's first do the following. So if the spin, so this, this one will just um, now measure this, as I said, but let's now, so when you look at this scenario, you should notice something. If, okay. yeah. if you look at this scenario, this is like the original Wigner's friend experiment, because if here is tails, then according to the rules, he should prepare a spin pointing to the right. But the spin pointing to the right is up plus down. And this guy here is like Wigner's friend, he measures in the up down basis. So, According to this guy here, so the blue computer would say the state of the green one will exactly be the superposition state. He will have observed up plus down in a superposition. 
And I told you before that this superposition can be tested in principle with a measurement, which I called the Deutsch measurement. So this was this. Um, so the measurement is, is, is the measurement which basically um, checks whether it's in a superposition between up and down. And I just wrote this as a summary. This measurement is designed in such a way that one particular outcome occurs whenever it's a superposition of up and down. And I call this measurement outcome failure. The reason why I call it fail is maybe not clear because that's what you would expect to happen to, to have this measurement outcome, but I call it fail. So the blue computer just makes this prediction. He, he says, whenever I have these tails, I prepare the spin to the right, and therefore this outcome of the red computer will be fail. So he shows this on his display whenever R was tails. Now comes the more interesting part. So if you didn't get that, just remember. So, so the only thing you have to remember is the following. The blue computer, whenever it prepared tails, will know for sure that the red computer, which was here, will measure fail. That's what you need to know. Now, now let's see what the green computer does. And this is now maybe the interesting part of the argument. Now we need to, for a minute, I, um, be kind of very focused to get that. So let's suppose um, it was tails. In this case, the spin was prepared right, and this measures in the up-down basis. Now let's suppose the outcome, I mean, with probability one half, this guy will get outcome plus one half or minus one half from his viewpoint. So if, if I just analyze this, if it's a spin right and I measure in the up down basis, I will with a certain probability get plus one half. But now, if suppose you are the green computer and you measure one half, and now you have to make a prediction whether R, whether this, this randomness was tails or heads. Remember that if it was heads, the spin would be down. So if it was heads and the spin is down, you would never see this outcome plus one half because that means it had some overlap with, with up. So therefore, whenever you see up, the only possibility that remains is that it was spin right because that has at least the probability of one half to get up. So the green computer can conclude that this random this randomness was actually tails. And now the green computer can simulate the whole analysis that the blue did, if you like. So the blue, I told you before, what you need to know is that whenever, whenever the blue computer sees tails, he makes this prediction. The green computer also knows that. So the green computer now knows that the blue computer made the prediction that the red computer will measure the outcome failure. And now by the consistency rule, he can just promote this knowledge to his own knowledge. So he, this what, what is written here now becomes his knowledge. In, the green computer now knows that the red one, which we'll measure later, one that is um, actually hidden here below this, um, this cloud, will measure fade. And this then proceeds in the same way. I will now not, not go in, in details, but the yellow one, the measurement of the yellow one is designed in such a way that he knows for sure that it, um, so whenever he gets a particular outcome, which I call okay, this is just one outcome that could happen. So whenever this outcome happens, the yellow computer knows that set was plus one half. And of course now the yellow computer knows that whenever set was one half, the green computer made this prediction. So this is now the knowledge of the yellow computer. The yellow computer can again use this consistency rule to say, I mean, you see, it's just what was inside here is now promoted to his own knowledge. So the yellow computer now knows what um, the red will measure. Finally, he communicates that to the red computer and tells him, oh, by the way, you will for sure um, measure failure. That's what I can predict with certainty. Now, the red computer does the measurement. He can now um, actually do this measurement. But now it turns out, and this is a calculation I didn't show, but one can now do the calculation within quantum mechanics and sees that with probability one, half, one over 12, it happens that the yellow computer will get outcome okay, and therefore send this message to the red one that it will certainly measure fail, but the red computer will still measure okay. So this is um, just something you, you get from looking at the 
overall quantum state of this and doing this. I mean, if you like, I can at the end in the question session show you that calculation, but you can also find it in the paper that you just have to believe me for the moment. So the red computer sometimes receives this message that he, with certainty, um, he should observe fail, but he will actually observe okay. So he's now in this uncomfortable situation that he's certain that he should observe fail, but he's also certain that it's okay because he actually measured this. So he will now bring this alarm bell that I mentioned before and say, my rules, the rules of, of reasoning were inconsistent. So that's a summary of the argument, basically. And of course, when one sees that for the first time, maybe it's, um, you see the flavor of it, but I, I promise you that if you look at the details, this is not hard to follow. It's very basic quantum mechanics and you just plug in all the rules of quantum, this simple rule, this overlap rule that I call the Born rule. I mean, to, so what did we do? We started with three rules, which I told you um, about, which each of them sounded reasonable. I mean, this is just the usual rule we apply when we do quantum theory. This is just a consistency rule that we should be consistent. And this is, of course, something quite obvious, except maybe for some politicians. So this led to a conclusion that is contradictory, which means that these three things are one of the three rules has to be wrong. So the, the bottom line of all this, the result is one of the three things was actually not that a good assumption. We don't know which one from this argument, but one of the three was obviously wrong, at least one of the three, because they were contradictory. And clearly nature is not by itself con logically contradictory. That um, would be strange. So let me briefly mention before I come to the conclusion that this thought experiment actually includes as building blocks many other thought experiments. It's a rather, yeah, you saw it's a slightly involved thought experiment. And if you analyze it, then you probably recognize that it has elements obviously from Schrödinger's cat and Wigner's strand, as I pointed out, and also this extension of Deutsch that I mentioned, uh, that, that you do a measurement. It also has ingredients from bell type arguments and actually concretely from what is called Hardy's um, argument. And it's also um, has ingredients from another sort experiment that was proposed by Chaslav Bruckner in Vienna. So now we have a, you can go back to these interpretations and ask yourself, what do physicists now believe? What is true? Which one of the three assumptions has to be wrong? So which one is the wrong one? And now we see now a quite interesting picture. It's very scattered what the different interpretations would say. I told you already the Copenhagen interpretation that just says you cannot apply quantum mechanics to macroscopic systems. So according to Copenhagen, you cannot carry out this experiment anyway, because you're supposed to remember that the computers to the right had to measure the, the left ones. And if you consider these as macroscopic objects, you simply cannot do that. So Copenhagen would say it's in a sense, yeah, you could say either that or that is wrong because um, at the end, you cannot be consistent in, I mean, some people would say, okay, maybe I should, okay. Oh, sorry. I put here actually, so what I said is about the old Copenhagen interpretation. There has been a revision of the Copenhagen interpretation, which is sometimes called the new Copenhagen interpretation. And this interpretation was probably invented because it turned out that it's not so clear what is microscopic and macroscopic. They would say at the end, it's just always, you have to define what is a measurement device and then the stuff that is not the measurement devices is, is the quantum system. So you have a cut between the measurement device and the quantum system. And that cut is sometimes called the Heisenberg cut. So it's kind of the cut that separates the quantum world which includes the quantum systems we investigate from the classical world, which includes the measurement devices and so on. And if you do that, then this cut can in principle be chosen. That's why it's called a movable cut. But if you do that, and this happens precisely in this experiment. So maybe if I briefly go back, you saw these clouds that I usually put. This is just what are the quantum systems? For example, for the green computer, this, this is the quantum system. For the Yellow computer, this whole thing is the quantum system. So here for the, the Heisenberg cut goes through here for the yellow computer. But for the, um, 
for um, the that computer, the Heisenberg cut goes somehow, I mean, divides or it's just around this, this little spin. So if you have this movable Heisenberg cut, then um, what, what turns out to be the case is that you lose this consistency as such. The same is true um, for other interpretations like this cubism that I mentioned before and consistent histories. I told you before, this is an interpretation where you say that people can have different views. But of course, even if they have different views, you would expect that there is some consistency. For example, if Pierre Alberto is sure that the spin measurement will give up, and I'm sure the same measurement will give down, then that's not really, I mean, one could say these are just different perspectives, but then we have different perspectives about an outcome of a measurement we could actually do. And so that's certainly not what the theory should do. That would be violated by these series, which is quite problematic. I don't maybe now want to go through the whole table. This is more to, to show to you that people still don't agree. I mean, they agree on that, that we should only see, I mean, if I see one thing, I shouldn't see the opposite, but um, yes. Okay, so this means it's actually, I mean, when you now learned quantum theory, for example, as a student, maybe at some point you have to think about what do you actually think? Of course, in practical experiments, this doesn't really matter so much because you only have a small system on which you operate. But as soon as quantum, let's say, technology evolves, this will become relevant. And so you can ask yourself, what did you actually believe? And which assumption would you abolish? You have to abolish one. There is also a challenge. So if you now think of this that in the way that this quantum thing is wrong or this is wrong. I mean, one of the three has to be wrong, one of the three assumptions. If you think, for example, that this is wrong, of course, you don't want to give up quantum theory completely. So you can make a proposal and say, maybe quantum theory is correct as long as, I mean, there were certain proposals, for example, by Scott Aronson, who said, maybe quantum theory is still correct, provided that the person who makes a prediction is later not subject to a measurement. So for example, he would say, if I now, I now make a prediction and say, this spin will be up when you measure it tonight. Okay, I made the prediction and told it to Pierre Alberto, and he knows now my prediction, so he can verify it later, but suppose in the meantime, I die, or I, I somehow get measured in this violent Deutsch measurement, which would be very destructive, then Scott Arnold would say, my prediction is by that measurement also destroyed in retrospect, so to speak. This would be a very strange, but that's a possible modification of quantum theory. That's a restriction. You say quantum theory can only be applied if I'm sure I'm still, I'm not myself subject to a measurement um, later. As this, this is, okay, hard to define because what does even consist in, I mean, constantly people look at me and measure me, so one has to be more precise, but you could somehow try to come up with some rules. So the challenge is now, and that's a challenge that is now open, and I, I think no one has really answered it so far in a satisfactory manner, it's, although there are some very interesting proposals around, I have to say, recently, um, that um, you want to program these computers with modified rules, Q, C, and S, such that they don't arrive at the contradiction, because that's clearly what we want. We want to have a, a worldview which is consistent. So this rule that I just mentioned that Scott Tarrenson would impose, this restriction could be an example. However, the challenge is difficult because you still want to get, you could just say never make a prediction. That could be a very good rule because then you certainly don't get into a contradiction. When you never say anything, you can also not yeah, run into, into a contradiction. But this rule would be bad because even in daily life situations, and, and I would say the, like, it's still a daily life situation in the sense that one computer would be used to model another computer. So that's something that should still work. So you don't want to exclude this from the rules. So the challenge is to have rules which are restrictive enough not to run into a contradiction in these complicated experiments, but at the same time relaxed enough so that you can still apply them to daily life situation. And I would now claim that, for example, this rule that I mentioned, about constraining the measurement that if I'm going to be measured, then my prediction is not valid, would be a bad rule because as I just said, I'm constantly being measured. As you look at me, 
So this would mean, according to that rule, I'm not supposed to make a prediction. Now one could say, okay, the rule only applies if I'm measured in a very complicated basis. But then the whole theory becomes basis dependent and that's a huge mess. So that would be very hard to define, I think. So the, I don't think there is any solution to that challenge yet, but I want to pose it here again, because I still have the hope that someone finds a good way to circumvent this paradox in a certain way. So this brings me to the conclusion. So what we have seen is that we have this red area that is currently impenetrable by real experiments, but we can do sort experiments to see whether the theories that we already have make um, reasonable predictions here. The answer is no, they don't, um, at least not in the form. If we apply them, one could now say maybe naively, maybe later in, in 50 years, we have a good view and say, oh, this was just a too naive way of of applying the, the rules, but in the way I just described it, if we apply it in that way, we run into a contradiction. Therefore, the way we have to apply quantum theory has to be somehow revised when we do it to when we apply to large objects. But how is unclear, and that's an interesting research direction, I think, because it also impacts actually research when you um, go to, for example, quantum gravity. There, we are naturally talking about large objects black holes and so on. And if quantum theory already becomes problematic when you apply to little computers, then clearly it's not that reliable when you talk about black holes, for example. So we should be careful there and um, try to see what can we constrain these things. Okay, so I would also like to thank my collaborators. These are just the people who are involved, were involved in this particular type of research, which is about the foundations of quantum theory. Daniela Frauchiger, who um, was the author of that um, paper that proposed the experiment, and Lydia Del Rio and Nuria Nurgalieva have, um, and Vilasini Venkatesh have worked on extensions of that. Simon Mattis, together with Nuria and Lydia, has also actually tried to, or actually written a simulation of this experiment, because I said, at the end, it's something you can do. You just program computers with these rules. And to just be very sure that these rules are not somehow I mean, that we didn't miss anything. Maybe there's some recursion if these computers um, reason about each other. We just um, asked um, Simon Mattis when he was a master student to actually program it. And so we have basically an implementation of this sort of experiment on simulated quantum. I mean, of course, the computers are, are not really isolated, but we just simulate that and um, verified in that sense the claims. Okay, then I would like to thank you. And I also have these pointers to literature in case you want to read more. In particular, I would recommend this one here because I figured that this original one describes the thing in a quite um, com more complicated way than necessary. And here we tried to simplify the description a lot. So if you're interested to see the calculations that I presented here in detail and the things I didn't show in particular, then I would like to refer you to that work with Nuria Nurgalieva. Okay, thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much for this interesting and challenging actually talk. Uh, now we are open to questions from the audience. Hello, everyone. Sir Paul, uh, I have to be not the lunch. Uh, first one is uh, about the fact that you were staying for the four years on the same thing with the common power chain. So, this first computer is very stagnant, you have pretty chunks a lot of the belt. And you also say that uh, maybe I don't know why the common theory itself is challenging uh, issues, probably, this is why. Very, very mm -hmm. Do you agree with this? 
Okay, yes. So um, let me maybe um, say a few things about this. So this is a very interesting question. So the question, if I understand it correctly, is basically, don't we now still apply quantum theory recursively to ourselves, so to speak, and therefore we are exactly in this regime that we shouldn't be in. And um, I would say, no, this is not the case. Actually, the reason why this involves four agents is exactly to circumvent this problem. And let me explain why, how it's circumvented. So remember that um, the blue computer makes a prediction about what the rate will measure. That's certainly safe because the blue can talk about the red one that's outside of his system. Now, the green one talks about what the blue will say about the red. So that's also fine because the green talks about what this one says about this. Now, the important thing is that as part of this reasoning, the green will at the end know what the prediction is about the red. And I mean, that was this consistency rule that said, as soon as the green one knows what the blue predicts about the red, he will also know himself what it is. So I think this was somehow here, you see, he knows this, and then he made this step. And now the important thing is from that point on, the blue one has no longer a role as an agent in this thing. The blue one is no longer needed. So in a certain sense, the red one, uh, the, the green one took over the knowledge of the blue. So here the, the green one knew what the blue knew, and now he takes over that knowledge. And from that point on, you, can, you don't need the blue any longer. And that's important because in the next step, the blue is going to be measured. So it would be very bad if that would later again be used. That would be contradictory if I would say, oh, the blue was subject to a measurement. And once I measure you in, in this complicated basis, it's not clear whether you can still make predictions because this measurement can be very destructive. That actually was a misunderstanding, I would claim, in, in, the, in the blog title of Scott Aronson, because he said, you, of course, you cannot make predictions when you are Hadamard. Hadamard is, is the name for this measurement. But this never happened. So this guy made a prediction before, and now he's no longer used. So it's OK if he measures it. And now, if you proceed in that way, you see that we never run into this problem, because now the, the yellow one um, reasons again um, about this. So that's fine. I mean, the yellow one can, of course, talk about um, the, the red one, because the red one, okay, the red one is now not shown, but it's here, so that's fine. And you can, um, um, and maybe you can now say in the final step, um, the yellow one communicates to the red one what he should, what he's supposed to measure. But that's fine. I mean, let's say if, if I told you, let's say I, I had a reasoning and I, I know what you are supposed to measure. And during this reasoning, you were never treated as a quantum system. That is, no one ever talked. So these outside computers are never, there's never a reasoning about them as quantum systems. So in this last step, it's just, if I was the yellow one, I would tell you, actually, um, yeah, you are now going to measure fail. For sure, we, we applied all these rules that as you would apply it then yourself, and now you measure fail. So I would claim, it's never, I mean, despite the fact that, um, let's say, maybe it's confusing because I said at the beginning, this one re says something about this one and so on. But at the end, um, it's not, when you look at the timing and what is needed at what time, there is never a circle. I mean, it, it's a circle in the sense of um, like every, there's always a connection between any two. Like, this one at some point talks about this one, this one at some point about what this will measure, but that's fine. I mean, I can, of course, talk about what you will measure later. This doesn't, it's not about talking about the red one as a quantum system. It's just saying, if the red one is going to measure that, he will observe that. So in that sense, I would say, there are no circles of that type that, um, and, and that was the whole point. Let's say if, if I would allow circles, I could just immediately say, what happens if I measure myself? And then I would probably run into a contradiction. And this complicated setup is precisely set up in that way. So to avoid this circle. Uh, second point, again, is about how quantum 
one of the bigger points that you can do this to your yes. other states. Uh, if the application system is not able to set up enough points and isolate the system, usually one of the system which could be some other master which some bigger. Uh -huh. Okay, yes, that's a good question. So the question is, what is this coin? So maybe I just use the word coin to make it a more illustrative. So what you would do for the computers is just you um, actually take, so what you need to do is to take a random, a quantum random number generator, which means the system is prepared in a superposition state of two things, and then you just measure whether it's one or the other. And because everything happens in this box, there is no entanglement a priori to the outside of that. So if you are going to a box and use within the box the random number generator, then of course, by looking at the number, you are entangled with the generator, but the whole box is still not entangled. Yeah, thanks for the very good questions. You, in your setup, you have uh, four agents. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. In the old terminology, you use the uh, the terminology of observers and of my system. Is it really important to, to identify the four agents in terms of classical observers? Some of them, for example, in the, in the lab, computer mm -hmm. could be a classical observer and mm -hmm. the other will be part of the system, or is this kind of terminology completely uh, out of time? Uh -huh. No, this, this is um, uh, a good point. So I, I said at the beginning, somewhere or in the middle of the talk, that the computers have two roles sometimes, namely they are objects, which I describe using quantum theory. And at the same time, they are subjects who use quantum theory. And then of course, when you use quantum theory and, and verify a prediction, you are the observer. So in, in this particular experiment, the yellow and the, the red one, they are always only the subjects who use quantum theory. So in that sense, you could say the yellow and the the red one, as you just said, are classical observers. That would be perfectly fine. For the green one, this doesn't work. The green one is, of course, whenever he applies quantum theory himself, he treats himself as an observer. That's the whole point, because, I mean, otherwise he, he's, he's then the subject. But from the viewpoint of the, of the red one, the green one is just a quantum system and not an observer. So if you would understand an observer in an absolute sense, not in a relative sense, then this wouldn't work. And that's precisely one thing you can say. You, you could uh, take an interpretation where you say you have to decide once and for all for every system, whether it's an observer or not. That's a possible interpretation, which is perfectly valid. Of course, the question is how you justify it when you look at the computer. Is this now an observer or a quantum system? But you could just say, I declare this to be an observer. And then you would avoid the paradox because then once you declared this to be only an observer and not a quantum system, I could not run the experiment for the green one because it's supposed to be also a quantum system. So in a sense, um, it, this is really at the core of the thing that let's say a bit, and I would say from today's perspective, if you talk to people, a more old fashioned view is that things are absolute. Either a system is an observer or not. I think a more modern viewpoint is that this is itself a relative notion. I can be an observer observing that thing, but I could at the same time be observed from the outside as a quantum system. So, um, yeah, that's, um, I hope that answers your question. Simple as a question there. Uh, <clears throat> when, when we speak about the Copenhagen yes. what are the main reference? Maybe the Bible from Oh, yeah, that's a, a question. Are there books of Vera and Neumann, or are there some other? No, I, I think the, the Copenhagen interpretation is in reality really a, a mix of many ideas that came together. There's even stuff from Niels Bohr and, and you, I think there is no, so I think the answer is there is no reference that defines what the Copenhagen interpretation is. And I, I could say maybe there are many Copenhagen-like interpretations, 
But the problem is that even those people who describe them change their minds over time. So <laughs> I think the Copenhagen interpretation um, is somehow maybe the only common thing among the details is that you somehow make a split between the observed system and the observer. I think that's common to everyone who writes about Copenhagen. But then I, I mentioned towards the end of the talk, there's this neo-Copenhagen where the split is movable and there's the old fashioned one where the split is fixed once and for all. But you see, even there, there's disagreement. So I think this is a terminology that somehow developed without having a well-defined definition. And probably that's just reflecting the fact that physicists really don't agree what it is. I hope that's not too worrying for all the students who now just learned quantum mechanics and now they hear that <laughs> physicists completely disagree on what it actually is. But be assured if you apply it, you always get the same results to, as long as the, the systems are very small and you only have to worry if you measure cats and quantum computers, which is a worry because that's maybe something you're about to do in the future. No questions? Thank you very much for this fascinating presentation. Uh, I just have a question about the last part, which was your conclusion, mm -hmm. uh, which said quantum theory cannot consistently describe user of quantum theory. I wonder if uh, it has to do anything with the part of consciousness. And uh, the other question that I have is about when you were describing the point toss and the uh, mm -hmm. uh, probability. Uh, I wonder if you can tell me a little bit about the uh, intrinsic probability of the quantum theory. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for the first question, I have a very clear answer. I would say this whole thing is completely separated from the notion of consciousness. And this was exactly our incentive because when you look at, when you read, I mean, this is very, uh, very to the point question because when you read Wigner's paper, he talks about consciousness as exactly the distinguishing feature. So I had always this line that you saw here where I have the different systems from small to large. And Wigner would say, okay, for Wigner, it was not a computer here, but a person. And he would say that exactly the difference why maybe here are different laws is because here is consciousness and here not. So Wigner was in his first paper, which is about the mind body question, the one I cited earlier in the slides, um, is, um, is, is seeing that as, as the important feature. Now in this work, um, I think this is much more technical, I mean, to the ground of, of, of um, notions which are in principle verifiable. So the experiment I described is something you can program computers with and say, okay, they just do whatever you like. They're users of quantum theory, even if these computers probably have no conscious perception of what they actually predict. They just do whatever they are supposed to predict according to the theory. So the answer is, this was exactly the incentive of this to put this on firm grounds and not refer to notions which are not so well defined. And I would claim now the rules that are here, as you see, they never refer to consciousness. They just said, yeah, use that particular rule, use that second rule, use the third rule. If you use these three rules, you will run into a contradiction. So yes, the idea was to separate it from the question of consciousness. Now for your second question about the role of randomness, um, I think this is a, again, a, an, I mean, the answer will depend on which interpretation you are in basically. And I, actually that's always a good answer when, when you are asked such hard questions so to speak, because you can always say, okay, there are different answers in the community. And I think it's always bad to, to do as if there's only one of them. So the answer is indeed a different one for each line of this thing. And I will be in print, I mean, not now, <laughs> or I mean, maybe after that, I don't want to bore people. I could go through this list and tell you for each list and uh, for each row, whether um, according to that interpretation, randomness is um, true randomness or, or inherent, or it's just some uncertainty from the viewpoint of an observer and so on. But maybe just to give you an example, in many worlds, this was this is what, for example, Lev Weidmann, who is one of the proponents of many worlds today, would say, 
the, the incentive of actually why he believes in many worlds is that this is a theory that gets rid completely of any randomness because everything happens. Of course, you could say this is a bit of a cheat. Like when you are unhappy that things are random, you just say, okay, if I toss this coin and now I'm unhappy at the fact that this is random, I just say, actually, it had both outcomes. Then um, I have, I got rid of randomness. You see, in, in, in many worlds, the answer is there is no randomness. Everything happens. It's in um, maybe a lot, uh, just the last and se second and last example in booming um, quantum mechanics, the randomness is kind of in the initial conditions of the universe. So in principle, if you would know what the initial conditions of all particles are, there is no new randomness when you do experiments. It's all deterministic from there. But the initial conditions may still have been randomly chosen. That we cannot say in that theory. So, and then in, in cubism, it's more random and so. So the answer is very complicated in that sense. And again, it's interesting for each of you, I would say, to, to decide which of the thing do you find convincing. If you ask me, I think because neither has three or can have three uh, marks, neither is really satisfactory, but that's not the problem of the interpretations. That's the problem that we haven't yet a consistent theory. So why should we interpret it if it's not yet consistent? Yes. Why you have a second mark in the computer rotation? Mm -hmm. And the second one is what, what do you call a computer? Because it could be something very small, for example. And mm -hmm. you know, actually, quantum mechanical. So, mm -hmm. Okay. So, for the first um, uh, thing, I would, the short answer would be. There are many, many worlds interpretations. <laughs> Not surprising. So um, it depends a bit on how you interpret again many worlds. So many, it's a bit like with Copenhagen. It's when you ask what is many worlds, and you look, for example, um, up, like there's this Stanford Encyclopedia for um, a philosophy, which contains very nice articles about each interpretation. It's very recommendable. I think the one about many worlds was written by Lev Weidmann. And he would, for example, say, um, in, um, clearly we, um, we are consistent, but then he has to get rid of something else. So he would probably then say, there is, actually, maybe I should have an, put another question mark here in that case. He would then say, maybe there is no, it, it's okay to have contradictory mm -hmm. outcomes because if there are many things. But I, I think most people who, who think of many worlds, want that you are still consistent within one branch. Like, even if I believe in many worlds, there's another branch of the universe in which we are somewhere else, in, in which I'm in Zurich, for example, and you are doing some are outside at the sun and enjoying this. Um, and now I still want to be consistent within that branch. So if you ask consistency to be consistency within a branch of many worlds, then it's clearly a, a cross. If you say, no, the consistency, the whole point of many worlds is that you cannot be consistent within branches, but the overall wave function is somehow consistent, then it would be, oops, then it would be a mark. Um, but then you have to somehow rethink this again, because now if you look at it, so it, it depends a bit. That's what's the reason for that. Now, what is a computer for the purpose of this talk? A computer is, has two purposes. It has to be a physical system that can be described by, quantums, by quantum physics. That's the first thing, and that's why I take a computer and not a human, because one could still argue a human is more than just a physical system. And the other is that it's, it can be programmed with the rules of quantum theory in the sense I had it. So we can, we can consider it the user of quantum theory exactly in that sense that it's just making predictions. Maybe it doesn't understand why it does this prediction, it just blindly applies the theory. It's as if you had some like I give you a book of a new theory that you didn't know and you just follow the rules and, and output predictions, say that's prediction. So it has these two aspects and the computer, it doesn't need to be a computer, but I think a computer unifies these two aspects very you know, illustrative way. No one would dispute that a computer is a quantum system and no one would dispute that a computer can be programmed with the rules of quantum theory. Otherwise there wouldn't be well-defined rules if I couldn't.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I was thinking that uh, would be even Swiss brand and I think more specialized in the term and the one you can buy here in Italy. Uh, and the fact that uh, essentially, as you can uh, move the cup uh, and uh, essentially the, the time when you start uh, uh, sending over the message of the message of the, uh, the result, uh, this is a interpretation to the the, the old, uh, even in the case of, uh, like for instance, in the uh, one to one debate choice experiment, you know, in which uh, instead of using uh, uh, before the measurement, the which type of measurement uh, to, to do, okay, uh, to keep in superposition uh, in your pointer mm -hmm. right afterward, mm -hmm. and which still holds the interpretation from the kinds. Yeah, as you were saying, uh, you do a measurement for, for the randomness, okay, so you get mm -hmm. state and then follows, okay. Mm -hmm. What if you, you keep the randomness like in the, in the paper on how? Uh, and then keep going in the side. Is this something that's... You mean if you if you keep the randomness quantum mechanically? Yeah, you keep it position. Oh, yes. So um, I think at the end, the analysis is... So um, the analysis of the whole thing is always like from the viewpoint, for example, of... Um, let me briefly go back to, again, this catch. So if, if um, the yellow thing analyzes this thing, because this is a closed system by definition until the point, of course, where he measures it and has to open it. But this is a closed system. So for, from the viewpoint of the yellow, this randomness has to be um, modeled as something that remains in superposition. So when I say that this person here, the blue computer generates randomness, what I mean is really he applies a quantum random number generator. And if you do that in the isolated box, it's just a pure state. So it's only random from this viewpoint. So you can actually analyze everything from the outside, if you like, and then everything is coherent. By the way, I have, because that's often, a, it's a very good question. And this question is asked very often. So I have here something that you can find in a nice paper from um, Jeff Bob. He did the whole analysis in a unitary picture, so to speak. So you, you just describe, it's kind of a many worlds picture. Um, and so you see, this is what, what is the, so he, this paper, okay, maybe the reference isn't somehow disappeared, but I can give you the reference if you're interested. It's Jeff Bob, and it says on the Frau Gerender experiment, that's the title. And it has, for each time of the experiment, it describes the full quantum state of everything. And that's the state at the very end of the experiment. So here, everything is kept coherent. And you see that here is one, I would say these are the branches now of the wave function in the many words picture. And in most branches, everything is okay. For example, I mean, it's a bit small to read, but for example, in this branch, you see that this is the, the computer who was on the right top, the one um, which I called Ursula, would in some cases not be able to draw a conclusion. And then there's also no contradiction, but there is one branch. This is, I think, um, uh, uh, that one, the, the, the fourth, the one here with this plus, this is a branch that occurs with probability one twelfth, where um, this is the computer to the top right has observed okay, and is certain that um, the red computer will observe fail. But in this branch, the red computer um, has actually observed okay. So you, what you find is there is really a branch in which there are inconsistent entries. And this is a, yeah, this is just to say that I never had to kind of collapse and make the randomness be coherent. So in, in this, um, let's say, description, everything is on the, on, on the level of, of doing everything at the very end. So there's, this will be the most delayed choice. I can now say, now at the very end, I look at everything and see with probability one twelfth there is one branch in which the knowledge of the agents is inconsistent. So this is just to, to stress the point that actually even illustrates the point before about many words that you asked about, that you are inconsistent without, within a branch. But Leif Weidmann could now, for example, say, yeah, it's okay if there is in one branch, he said that the outcome, he cannot know the outcome 
And the fact that in one branch he said it's fail doesn't mean in the same branch it has to be fail, and then we are fine. But then we are in a completely non predictive environment because then when I now predict that in a minute from now we'll still be here, this would mean maybe in another branch I'm here, but not in that one. Then it's unclear what that means. But that's a, a way out, which I find not very satisfactory, however, because we move to an unpredictable zero. But this was just also to illustrate that. Well, there is a question from uh, student. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's more clarification. In fact, mm -hmm. say the blue computer knows that this green one is up, and he knows that coins will stay, and the red one will not fail. In this case, with the blue, shouldn't say that the red must might fail. Okay, that was how it fast for me. Um, um, yeah, maybe now I have, as I have the picture. So the, the question is about this step, I guess, if I wrote this correctly. So, okay, maybe you have to tell me again the start of the question to make sure what confusion could the be. Do computer know that if the green one makes an up? Then he knows uh -huh. that the coin will stay, and the red one would not fail. In this case, mm -hmm. blue shouldn't say that the red. Oh, one yes. Now I see what. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. Um, I think, you know, um, the whole idea of this is that, um, at the end there are different ways to talk about the same outcome. So we want to somehow, um get a contradiction with the rules. And in order to get a contradiction with the rule, you somehow apply the rules, the, the same rules, but in two different ways about the same thing. And then you see, if I apply it in that way, I get that particular result. I get that it should be up. If I apply it in the other way, I get the opposite. In our case, the other way is just what the red predicts. So clearly there are flexibilities of how you apply the rules. Now we just chose one way to apply it, but the rules, I mean, are freely up, applicable so i never let the blue computer reason about the green one this just doesn't occur in, in the rules now you could of course say okay let's also do that and then maybe arrive yet at another result so maybe what what this question hints at is that we could say the blue shouldn't be allowed to use the rules in the way I use them, but he should use them in a different way. But then, in order to do that, one would need to impose a constraint on the rule and say, why is the blue not allowed applying in that way? Why should he first reason about the green one and not directly about the red one? And if one has such a, a, a restriction to the rule, then it may be that one could avoid the contradiction. So the point is, again, when, when you want to avoid the contradiction, you need to constrain the rule, not find another way how you could also reason, because that just adds more to potential contradictions but that's um yeah a good point thanks yeah. um, so all this uh, very nice uh, construction reminds uh, uh, a call somehow in the set of problems so i was wondering what the relation or if this is simply an example of a statement that cannot be decided which comes out in the global in the undecidable state so exactly this. an example of that or is something yeah, I mean, it's somehow the opposite. So actually, this is, a, again, one of the questions, you know, I gave this talk, or I talked about this many times, because people seem to be very interested. And this is also a question that often comes up. And so I have even for that a slide. <laughs> so um, it's um, maybe the slide wants to point out that this whole argument is a bit contrary to good. It's kind of the opposite direction. Okay, this is a bit formalized now, but I would say that what I said in this talk um, could be phrased more formally in the following way. One says, we have a formal system. This is the set of all rules. Of course, one needs to, we can program them. That's why we have this project with the master student to really make them precise. So they are not vague and really put them. And these rules are basically concrete, um, like concretizations of what it means Q, C, and S. And then what we show is that this, this formal system now, F, can prove, so this symbol means can prove that 
the formal system is not consistent. So that's basically what our argument shows for this particular formal system. So which consists of these rules. Whereas what a Gödel type statement would be is that there exists. So we, we assume that um, F is consistent, then we cannot. So it's not true that F can prove that it's consistent. So it's kind of the opposite. So here we just prove it's inconsistent. But Gödel would say the opposite. If it was consistent, we couldn't prove it. But if we can, this doesn't exclude the possibility we can prove it's not consistent, which we did somehow. So that's somehow the relation to Gödel. Now I don't have, I don't know, you asked about the example, but I would no, rather no. make the point it's really kind of the opposite direction because it's inconsistent. Clearly, you cannot prove the consistency. So, yeah. I just have a quick question. So, mm -hmm. suppose you, you, are in a, you are in a relativistic system with infinite degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. So you would still uh, apply all of this um, coming from ETH. Uh, <laughs> <no. laughs> yes. Okay, I, I could now to give two answers to this question. Let me first give the second. <laughs> the second will be is um, Jörg Fröhlich, your former supervisor, completely disagrees with all this. But uh, since several years I'm discussing it with him, and I didn't figure out with which assumption or with what point he disagrees. But he would, okay, the first part of the question, there's indeed, um, I think the main criticism that is often brought up is that this whole thing doesn't make sense because you cannot put the real macroscopic system into a perfectly isolated box, and then describe it as a quantum system because any real system has infinite dimensions and you cannot get called of that. That's one reason why I'm talking about computers because if I program a quantum computer with the rules of of quantum theory. I don't care about isolating the keyboard of the computer or everything. I only need to isolate the logical bits of the computer which actually carry out the relevant computation. And that's clearly finite dimensional. That's just the finite storage or working storage size of the computer. So my answer, my first, maybe more direct, not less sociological answer is that we don't need the infinite dimension. We just do this argument on computers which have a finite storage, which is true for most computers I know of. And I mean, we only need the finite storage, even if it had infinite one. So in other words, quantum theory can, the assumption is therefore quantum theory can be programmed on a computer with finite storage, which doesn't mean that, yeah. Um, the the last question. Yes, that's something I, I put a bit on the, the I, I said at the beginning something briefly about that when I had Schrödinger's cat. I said, let's suppose, sorry, when I click that I click so, so these slides, but I just want to go to the very first, almost very first one with the Schrödinger cat, which I think was here. I said, let's suppose that. We can, the, the box is perfectly isolated, but for a moment we can inject the spin. So I, you can think of this as like I have, again, if you think of computers, I can have a, perf a computer where all the logical bits are perfectly isolated and I just still communicate one additional logical bit to the computer. So this is how one should understand it. So um, Physically, you could see, think in print, okay, that would be very hard to implement, but it's a communication channel of one qubit. So you could say, I mean, that's what we do, for example, in quantum cryptography, we send a qubit encoded on a photon into a lab, which is, and then the idea would be the lab is otherwise isolated. So again, this is hard to do technologically. Therefore, I really prefer to think of computers and then it's very clean. And there the story is just, I send the qubit to a quant to a computer which then measures it. Okay, so I think it's uh, running yes. out of time. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot for the very interesting questions and for your patience. And I'm sorry for going over time. Thank you. <laughs>